Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the BallQuest.com Mailbag Podcast, brought to you by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Glad to have you along with us on this Friday. Check them out at Blue Water or at Blue H two O underscore Climate on Twitter. You can check them out at BlueWaterClimateControl.com with Austin Price and Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs. Let's get right to the questions, and we have plenty of them this week as football is up and running in the college game, and we'll talk a little bit more throughout this. Uh, podcast about sort of where things may go or may not go from here. Interesting, Tennessee moving its practice on Saturday to a night practice uh, instead of a four o'clock practice. I'm told they're going to practice at seven o'clock tomorrow night. Guys, you got to wonder if that's not an effort to try to keep guys, not give them any choices to make in terms of going out and hanging out on campus on Friday nights. These kids have done a pretty good job, but look, if you're on the practice field at 10, um, you know, maybe you don't go out and, and get into a, a, a place where you don't need to with a gathering of people considering the, the, the more number of people that are on campus right now. I, I don't maybe think you're that's not a bad move Sanders by Jeremy. A, maybe you're not in, in the fort with 200 people at a, at a party where 75 people ended up with COVID. Yeah, that's certainly what the, you hope is the case. Maybe that's why Jeremy Pruitt moved. But apparently they are going to go on Saturday evening instead of Saturday afternoon. All right, let's go to Signal Ball out of the gate. Uh, can y'all go into the McDonald's story a little bit more? More than a bit confused about what went on there. Um, I think there's some people <laughs> who manage the roster publicly who are a little bit confused on what happened there, Austin. Uh, he was on it, he was off it, and, and now he's back on it and, and remains at Tennessee, although he's dealing with uh, an injury and is not going to play this year. Well, you know, he had the surgery, you know, during COVID, and then – uh, you know, Lenith Whitehead has got a, a you know recurring foot deal that goes back to his Liz Frank uh, injury last fall. So both those guys are candidates for you know potential gray shirts. You know, um, you know if you're if you're close on the number, you know those guys can't play this fall. You know, or or, or are unlikely to play this fall. You know, does it make sense to say okay instead of you know, getting rid of somebody that actually can be a, a warm body, does it make sense to say, hey, go home, let's not start your clock. That way you don't even, you don't even redshirt. You just go home and then you'll still have five years to play five starting in fall of 2021. You can come back in January. Um, you know, I know that was part of, you know, at least some thinking there for a while. Now, I, I never knew that one way or the other, but when he wasn't on the roster, it seemed like, you know, you could connect the dots and that made sense. But then all of a sudden – they put him back on the roster, so um, at some point, you know, they'll 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 get to their eighty-five number. <laughs> and I assume they're there now. Um, here's, the, here's the other thing too. I wonder if they're going to get a little. If everybody's going to get a bit of a relief on the eighty-five number with the vote that's scheduled to take place today uh, regarding you know this year doesn't count against anybody's eligibility. So if you stay on campus, your clock doesn't start anyway because. The, if they pass the vote, the vote you would get your you would get the year back. Everybody gets the year back, so they give some relief on the eighty five right now. Maybe that's part of what's going on. I, I don't know, but that's kind of the backstory on why that it appeared that that he might be going home and be a gray shirt. Why he wasn't on the roster, and then when I called for the official reasoning, I got a call back that said, "No, he's on the roster. We're adding him back right now," and they did. So as, at this point, he is on the roster. We'll keep a close eye on that. Any other roster changes? that take place in the coming games or in the coming weeks. Uh, four, two, three volunteer, three freshmen who could start at some point this season. I don't know that there are three freshmen uh, and that's not a knock on this class. I think that's, that's a credit to the depth that Tennessee has developed. I think there's some wide receivers who could play, but I don't know that you'll see three freshmen out of this class start unless Tennessee has a bunch of injuries, Rob. I agree. And, and, I, and I you know wrote this when we were doing the position previews. It's just the, the fact that you look at this freshman class, which, you know, might be the best one Jeremy signed here in three years. And there's not a guy that you're counting on to play. I mean, last year you're talking about two offensive linemen that had to play. You're talking about a, a linebacker, Henry T, who was one of the best players on the defense who who had to play. And, um, yeah, I mean, nobody has to play out of this freshman class. I don't think – I definitely don't think there's three guys that are going to play unless there's a spate of injuries or, or COVID quarantines. Right, three guys who are going to start. start. There'll be three guys that play. No, that's what three guys play. I, I don't think there's three guys that are going to start at all. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I think, think Jalen are... Hyatt can play. I think um, Keyshawn can play. Tyler Barron certainly you know, could, could play. Maybe Morgan Joseph plays. 
any of the any of those wide receivers, Holiday, Callaway, Wyman, could play, but I don't, I definitely don't think three guys are gonna start. Yeah, I think that three guys could start, you know, a, a game. You know, like Keyshawn may start a game or you know, Hyatt may start a game or Weidman may start a game, and that equals three. But as far as consistent starters, 100% agree. But I do think a lot of them do play because I think a lot of them are going to end up inevitably being in the two deep. Yeah, I think so. And, and again, play, but starting are two different things. But I do think you'll see a number of these guys play because Jer- Jeremy Pruitt and his staff are not afraid to play the freshmen, as we well know. And, and there's some positions where some guys can be in the rotation. All right, 19 – uh, Vol 70 wants to know, given the 10 opponents we have, what changes would you have made, if any, to the schedule that was announced? Move the open date, move opponents, opponents to another date on the calendar. Thoughts on playing on Thanksgiving, Vandy only five days after playing at Auburn. Look, I, I didn't think the schedule draw, in terms of how the calendar laid out, was bad. If you're looking for the perfect scenario, you flip Missouri and South Carolina the first two weeks. Therefore, you're opening at home instead of opening on the road. And then I think in the first part of November, you could have flipped the game down there, maybe that Arkansas A&M game, so that you've got Arkansas between A&M and, I guess, Auburn at that point. Other than that, I don't think it's a terrible draw for Tennessee from a calendar standpoint. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing it, but I just don't think it's as bad as it could have been. Anybody agree, disagree? Considering you're playing five of the top 13 in the country before all the – you know, cancellations out of the Pac-12 and, and Big Ten. Um, yeah, I think that you could not have laid it out any better. I mean, sure, you're right. I mean, you, you can nitpick, a, you know, one or two things. But as far as the fact you don't play Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, that's your traditional big three. You, you don't play them back-to-back with anybody. Now, you do have Kentucky sandwiched in between Georgia and Alabama, and Kentucky is, you know, slated to be better than, than normal this year. But – it's still Kentucky. So, like, from a mindset standpoint, I don't think Tennessee's kids are going, oh, Kentucky's going to be tough to handle. Well, and I just don't feel like the, the October gauntlet's as bad as it's been because it's not, all, <laughs> it's not those four game, four top five games grouped together, essentially. As you mentioned, you go, you know, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, you know, or Auburn was in there, whoever was in there. I, I just – I don't think it's as bad in that four-game <laughs> stretch that they've dealt with in the past. Butch's ill-fated 2016 run was Florida, Georgia, A&M, Alabama. And so when you won the first two and you had beaten the top two in your division, then you had to go to A&M and then Bama. It just, you know, it, it never ends. I've but said it before, AP. I've said it before. You, you think you can't make the SEC championship if you beat Florida and Georgia in the East to start the year? Butch Jones says, hold my beer. Hold my beer, AP. <laughs> Go to Volman 56. Did J.J. Peterson and Elijah Simmons enter fall camp in shape? Do you see them getting some run this year? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, J.J. Peterson, as we had in the war room, has moved outside. You want to work outside? Can he pick that up? Is that easier for him to play than the inside position? And then Elijah Simmons got a new coach. I think he's in better shape, Austin, physically. Um, but there's some depth there. I mean, I, I think you would expect him to be somewhat in the rotation but I think he's got to go out and earn it this fall camp. That's a guy who missed spring practice, and that was a big deal, to, in my opinion. Both those guys not having spring ball. Yeah, I think both of them, uh, you know, J.J. from just the, the reps and the mental side of things needed spring ball. Um, I'm interested to see what he does outside. He has trimmed down some. I, I mean, I think Elijah Simmons, you know, shape-wise, I mean, maybe fractionally better, but, I mean, like, he kind of is who he is body-wise. You know, I mean, that's who you want him to be. You know, because, I mean, he's only, what, 6'1". So, I mean, like, you want him to be kind of this tugboat kind of kind of figure um, in, the, in the middle with the low center of gravity and all the power. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it just depends on, you know, how they uh, – how quickly they can pick it up in fall camp and how quickly they can kind of assert themselves into the fray. Ball fan 89, Rob, do you think Jeremy Banks has a legitimate chance to push for playing time next to Henry, or is that spot cues to lose? Oh, God, I mean, how can you say it's cues to lose when he's you know never started a football game? I mean, I think I mean I I think Quavaris will start there, but I think Jeremy plays. I mean, just on the face of it, he's he's the third inside linebacker. When you say we just talked about JJ moving out, he's yeah, the I only know. other guy that that's played there other than um, Salon Page, who's you know played in emergency situations, and I think Jeremy's ahead of him. Yeah, I think he plays in there because I think you play more than two linebackers. 
you know, um, and, and look, we, we, you know, somebody's got to go win that job next to Henry. We expect, you know, you would think that that's Q, but um, again, I, I don't think that's Locke's stock done. And I think, I think both those guys uh, are going to play in the rotation. And, and after the way Jeremy thought about him the other day, I mean, Jeremy's not a guy to, you know, just blow sunshine. No, about kids. you know, Austin, that, that was interesting. You know, how Pruitt has talked about Jeremy Banks. He's always, even right after, right after the incident happened, he just always believed that kid deserved a second chance. I don't know if it's the personality, if it's maybe the history. Jeremy knows more, Jeremy Pruitt knows more about Banks' history than everybody else does. But he is, he has been very committed from the get go that, that the kid deserved a second chance and has fought hard for that kid to have a second chance. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I, he does know more about the the upbringing and, and, and kind of backdrop of Jeremy Banks, um, you know, than, than most people know. And, I mean, I've kind of heard some of that stuff, but yeah, I don't think that's my right to share. So, I mean, like, I do think that, you know, it's not about saving the kid. It's just about, like, hey, look, this kid has had everything thrown in his way for 18 or 19 years. Let, let, let's move a boulder here for him and not have to have him scale it or find a way around it. And, you know, he, he put some, you know, some tough things in, in Jeremy's way to come back. He's come back. Some of that though, like a lot of the police stuff that he, where he was going and visiting police stations and that kind of thing, that was Jeremy Banks's idea. You know, he realized he screwed up. He had, the, you know, as, you know, as coach Brooke called it a, you know, bad 20 minutes or whatever. Um, so I, I think that, you know, for the kid, he, he does got kind of an infectious personality and like when pointed in the right direction, I think has a ton of upside and just a, a genuinely likable kid. Let's go to Pine Mountain Ball. Who wants to know what's the chances you see a two quarterback system, uh, with JG and Maurer against USC. How many, Ors on the first team depth chart, more ors than we want to count. I don't think Jim Chaney's got any desire to play a two quarterback system. If they're playing two quarterbacks, then that means the starting quarterback's not getting the job done. I agree. I think JT Shrout is most likely to be Tennessee's backup. Again, Brian Mauer can still be that guy. Everything I continue to be told, though, is is there's just a lot of, you know, bus, you know, lining up the running back on the wrong side of him play after play or, you know, setting the wrong protection, you know, those type of things. But again, when Mauer does things correctly, flashes as much as anybody, but it, it, there's just too many mistakes. And then Harrison Bailey, Harrison Bailey just hasn't had time. You know, uh, that's what, that's, that's the biggest thing with, with, with Bailey. One, you know, everybody put the weight of the world on this kid. Like he had taken a picture with Bob Shue beating an ice cream cone. Just like, <laughs> and and it, that ain't fair well, to the kid. Well I played, said, I man. For months. Like he was coming in here with way too much, an, you know, anticipation and pressure on him, you know, because he won a state title in, in, in Georgia, you know, I'll as, start. as a senior. Yeah. And, and he, he moved five to five stars late in the process. Yeah. And that doesn't mean he's a bad player. Nobody's saying he can't play, but the, the thought process that, you know, he's getting a gold jacket in Canton a year into his college career, you know, it's just, was well, just, I mean, it's just been too much. And he missed spring practice because there was no, no, it's different sports. But two years ago when Eve's pond started all those games early in the year and shot the three, like the three of us shooting the three, everybody hey, said, leave, oh. leave, leave my name out of your mouth. AP on the three point shooting. Come on. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and, and everybody would just – would never have pegged him for what he has become. The point is, is sometimes it just takes time to develop. Kids get better. Look at Kids John Fulgerson was a second-team All-SEC last year. He couldn't dribble and, and chew gum at the same time three years ago. Yeah. Well, and, and, and then on the flip side, too, I mean, you had a guy like Josiah James who had – you know, he was he was a lottery he, pick. The way of the world. Here, right? I mean – and, 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 and Nigel Warrior. Right. I mean, that's just part of it. That doesn't it mean is, anybody's yeah. a bad player. It just means it, it takes, takes time. It takes time sometimes. Yeah. All right. Ball Rocker wants to know, can you address the report from the Clemson mod saying that they lead for Ty Simpson? Ooh, How AP. nervous should Tennessee bit fans be, Austin Price? Well, here's what I do know. Ty is very calculated in any comments he makes. Um, Ty is also, I think, 
really close with me. Now, do I know where he's going? He doesn't know where he's going. He and I had an in-depth in conversation this week about everything. He, you know, this whole notion that somebody leads or I think Tennessee's in a great spot because they've always been there. You know, and I told him this. I said, you know, because he was talking about Oklahoma. You know, they, they had this virtual visit with Oklahoma and, you know, the great job they did. And I said, you're not going to Oklahoma. You know, I said, you're going to go to Tennessee or Clemson. I said, you love to play like this, like, oh, like everybody's equal. And I said, and I, you know, I said, I play along, you know. But, I mean, like, Tennessee and Clemson are the top two for this kid. And, and yeah. Hubbard, you, you can speak to this. You, we've been, and this is no offense. I'll, we know some of these people. We like them. Kentucky basketball, Clemson football, the biggest homer media base in, in America. Well, I mean, you know, they, they think they lead for everybody at some point in the process. You know, and, and look, I, I'm, with, I'm, with, I'm with Austin in, in speaking to him, speaking to Ty, uh, his dad for a bit, and, and talking to people around there. The Clemson offer carries weight. Okay, that's one I think he was he wanted. Now does he want? He does he does he is he waiting on it to go there or is he waiting there to say hey I got offered by Clemson? I think that's I think that is the there's kind of two different points there. Just because he was waiting on it doesn't mean he's going there. Um, I think Chris Winkie's got a, done a good job with the relationship here. I think Jim Cheney's done a good job with the relationship here. And it's going to come down to those two schools. You're exactly right, Austin. That, that, those are the two schools that he will be deciding from. And I don't think he's any – he's close to, to making a decision right now. Well, I don't think he like wants Brock to be in Van any hurry. Much like Brock Vandergriff, who before he committed to Oklahoma was adamant that he wanted his grandparents to be able to watch him play and then picked Oklahoma knowing that was going to be hard – the grandparents in this deal are going to be a, are going to have a no, not going to have a huge say, but I think the ability for them to come watch him play is very important to him and the family, which means there's only a handful of schools where they're going to be making that drive to. Oklahoma ain't going to be one of them, so that's why again I go back to it's Tennessee, it's Clemson, and I I just it's almost like at the end of the day, your old steady girlfriend is always in the picture. There might be a hot girl that comes along and you turn your head, but old steady is always right there by your side. And Tennessee's been there the longest. So thus, I think Tennessee will be there the longest in this recruitment. All right, let's go to uh, the next question. I know he's a 2023 prospect. Where do the Vols stand with Darius Redmond? Since Lowe coached Ak Perogane, does that help the Vols with Redmond? I think uh, it, it fractionally helps. Uh, Adarius is, you know, a, a good-looking prospect. I think the the you know he can only be better going forward. He had a ton, made a ton of plays as a freshman, but I think it's only going to get better uh, from here. He, he and Jordan Potts, who is the sophomore quarterback at Pal, now will work together for the next three years. I you know I mean like, and, and for the for the Potts kid. I'm not sure he's a power five quarterback, but is he going to play college football? I think he's got a shot because everybody's going to play with Redmond and Redmond's going to naturally make him look good. So um, I'm interested to kind of see how that, that works out. They've got another receiver there um, at Powell who will be a, you know, you know, a borderline, you know, power five guy, MTSU type of player. Um, so, you know, this is a, a kid that's got some talent around him, um, but he runs great routes has good hands, although he did have some drops last year against Oak Ridge in our game on, on Rivalry Thursday. Um, I'm excited. That's who we have on the schedule next week uh, is Powell and Anderson County. So if you I can't wait to hear Mark Packer break that one down. Uh, if you have a chance to watch the kid next Thursday, um, and then you can tune in and watch uh, you know, Rob Lewis yell and scream at refs on Saturday night as we have Weston Farragut. So we'll have a, uh, we'll have a camera on Rob. He'll have his coffee, at least we think it's coffee, uh, you know, and, and uh, be able to watch him yell. I'm a little worried about my voice showing up on the broadcast with the, reduced, with, with the third crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad there was no ISO camera on me last night in the broadcast. On well, that's because you paid me a, a $100 every time I mentioned Eli's name. <laughs> there were some ISO cameras on Eli Hubs <laughs> racking up quarterback sacks. All right, let's go to CFF. What's the status of bowl games? There are probably not enough teams to play and fill them up. I don't think we know what's going to happen with bowl games. I think it's going to be hard for bowl games to happen outside of the playoff. I mean, there certainly because, can't be 
because you're not going to have full stands, and that's the whole point of bowl games, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, and, and people, I mean, people are going to travel to your city, and I mean, you're certainly going to have 30 bowl games unless you're going to take a bunch of, you know, four and, four and six, three and seven teams. So, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think anybody knows. I think right now everybody's trying to see if they can get to week are one and have play a, a football game. Right. What's, what's all that going to look like? I think you're trying to get to week one and, and see if you can play there. All right, Logan Bartlett, can you talk a little bit about Walter Nolan's recruitment? Sounds like we got a chance there, but what timeline is he on? Who will be influential in his decision? Who's Tennessee's main competition? I think the competition, Austin, is Ohio State, LSU, I think Clemson. I think for Tennessee to be in it, they got to get him on campus. His parents will be heavily involved in the decision. Um, parents have a good relationship with Marlon Walls. He has a good relationship with Marlon Walls. That doesn't hurt Tennessee. Uh, but I don't think this one's in any kind of hurry right now. I think he's very young in the process. Very young in the process, and he's on his timeline, <laughs> which is nowhere close. <laughs> to being uh, a timeline. You don't want it to be. And you don't want it to be. This isn't one – like, one, this just is not a kid that's going to shut it down early. He's a quiet kid who is not going to be all over Twitter bouncing around and – and you just watch his Twitter. He tweets very, very small amounts, which yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do think Clemson, LSU, Tennessee, Ohio State, Alabama, those are kind of the top five in my opinion. Tennessee is very much in this thing. And he and his family really like Jeremy Pruitt and Derek Ansley a ton. All right, let's go to the next one. Do you think beating South Carolina in week one helps with TID at all? Or is that something people read too much into? Also, how much improvement do you think Mims and Munden are looking for out of Tennessee? Uh, like, are they looking for record-wise improvement or just overall look at the team against big opponents? Um, I think Good you got to get over the hump in some of these games. Tennessee can't, Tennessee can't go 5-5 five and five and lose, you know, to all the big five teams they're playing. You know, I, I think you've got to win some games. Uh, you know, as far as TID, I've felt like the last couple of weeks he's close, but he's not ready yet. And having spoke to him late this week, that's the feeling that he definitely gave off. He wants to take a visit to Tennessee, wants to bring his mom over. Here's the problem. His mom is pregnant. So trying to align that up is, is, is you know, more difficult than it would normally would be. So is he willing to pull the trigger and, and do it without, you know, you know him visiting again, uh, you know, as far as in person virtually? I don't know. Uh, I do think Georgia has, has kind of risen there. I think it's Georgia, Tennessee. And then I think North Carolina may actually be supplanting South Carolina as the third team in that race. But again, as he told me, I'm an SEC player, which just tells me it's Georgia and Tennessee as of right now. Yeah, the North Carolina um, ties is some of the basketball stuff. He knows some of the kids in the North Carolina class he played basketball with for, for several years and some AAU stuff. And I think that's where – He's getting some of the North Carolina influence. But he's maintained that he's always been an SEC guy. And he's maintained that while he wants to get it done, he's not ready to get it done. I think that was the situation in, back in the spring when he decided not to do something. May, June, June July, July, and then now in August. <laughs> All right. Vols aren't getting much love from the media after the new schedule released. Over under four wins seems low. And ESPN projecting has Tennessee at four wins. Even Kentucky is getting more love. Fair to say Tennessee enters the season as the most underrated team in the league, Rob Lewis. Everybody hates the Vols. I, I mean, I, I definitely think Tennessee's a much better spot than Kentucky as far as the roster goes. I would be – I mean, I, I would put the over-under at five, personally. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I, I think – I mean, we, we've talked about it ad nauseum. I mean, I think – with what they did last year and with recruiting, I think Jeremy has gotten this thing to the point where they're below Georgia, Florida, Alabama, as far as your traditional rivals, but they have climbed back up the, you know, the, the hillside to the point where they're looking back at, at Vanderbilt, Missouri, Kentucky, South Carolina. So, I mean, I, 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 I don't know that they're like the most underrated team in the league, but I think, I would I would definitely get over four wins. Yeah, I would say five and five is is you know or six and four. I think that's I mean I said on when the schedule was announced I said six and four uh, because I just, just think I mean and just looking at it upper we were talking about like the, the you know, right new opponent previews Auburn I, I mean unless Bo Nix you know makes a huge jump 
they've got some problems. Well, and we know Jeremy Pruitt knows Auburn better than anybody else in – better than any other team in this league because of how much research he's put in him for years when he was a GA at Alabama, helping, helping the defensive staff get ready for that game. That was the team that he was assigned to figure out what Gus Malzahn was doing because some of that stuff was giving their defense problems. So – and we saw and that maybe two Nix years does, ago. Maybe Nix does take a jump because, I mean, he's obviously talented. But he wasn't – I mean, he wasn't Trevor Lawrence as a freshman by, no. by any means. No, all right. They, couple, I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, that was it. I was just going to say, but they lost their, you know, all Derek Brown, top, you know, lost big time defensive linemen. I mean, Auburn, to me, I, I don't get them being a top 15 team. Well, and even I, with 45 teams that play college football. Yeah, and I think between A&M and Auburn, one of those two teams is going to be a disappointment from the preseason ranks. I don't know which one's going to be, but I think one of those teams is not going to be as good late in the year. As they, as they thought it was going to be. All right, a couple of quick hitters here. More likely that you have March Madness or football in November? Football okay. in November. Football in November over March Madness? I, no, only, I say that because I think if you have football in November, you have March Madness. So I think it's more likely that um, – I think more likely March Madness than football in November right now. Because I think the NCAA will work to figure out a way to make Just, March Madness happen. Because that's all their money. Yeah, because that's seven hundred and fifty million dollars. That's their and money. They're, they're not losing. They're not losing a billion dollars over two years. They're going to figure out some way for that to happen. Pick one 2019 non-starter that the football team can least afford to lose. I'm going to cheat here and say Eric Gray because I think Ty Chandler will be the first tailback out on the field. That so, is a cheat. That's a that's, cheating. That's, that's, that's a that, that's my cheating answer on that, that one, is fellas. A cheating, cheating move. <laughs> All right, best chance of upsetting Auburn, Florida, or A and M? I'm gonna say right. Auburn based on Rob I'll Lewis's go, pick. Just go with all. Yeah, look, I heard you talk about it. I would, I would say Auburn too. All um, right, you like what? Alan, what did you say? <laughs> let's go to let's go to C Web eighty two. Let's know does the NCAA vote to allow fall sports athletes to compete without it counting as a year of eligibility have any impact on Cade Mays' appeal process? I don't think it does, but I think it's crazy to think that you're not going to give Cade Mays some kind of waiver here. You're not going to win an appeal there. And, and all that's going, going on right now, I just – I can't – I know the conference doesn't like, you know, transfers within the conference and all that stuff. But I just – at the end of the day, I just can't see them not getting Cade Mays – letting Cade Mays play this year. Well, Maybe especially after they came out and said – it don't even count. You're eligible. Right. That's what <laughs> well, he's doesn't work against you. Like that yeah. seems like the, the the dumbest thing and the most NCAA thing ever. Yes, I agree. I agree. All right, a couple of hoops questions here. Is Victor Bailey Jr. seeing more time at the one or the two guard at season's end? Which guard? Vascovi, Bailey, Springer will have long more minutes at this point. Rob Lewis. Uh, Bailey's playing way more at the one, like almost exclusively, and. I don't think there'll be much difference in the minutes played between Bailey Viscovi and Josiah. All right. Follow-up basketball question from him. Uh, sounds like uh, Keon is near a lock to start with Pons and Fulkerson, obviously. What two players play the most minutes at the other two spots in the first 10 games? Bold prediction. Go to Vegas with it. Hang on. What, what was this, that second part? All right. What two players will play the most minutes at the other two spots in the first 10 games considering Pons, Fulkerson, and Keon Johnson are starters? Uh, I mean, I think it'll be really close. I, I, I would say Springer followed by Bailey, but that's just a guess. I mean, like I just said in the previous question, I think Bailey, Han, or Bailey, Josiah, and Viscovi, I think are going to play really similar minutes. I mean, like 20, right, you know, right around 20 plus a game. And I, I've been writing in the war room every week, so I didn't, I didn't even throw it in there last night, but spoke with somebody yesterday who, who saw a pickup game and I just can't stress and I, I've never heard anybody run the program talk about a player the way people are talking about Keon Johnson right now it's it's insane I heard I heard the I had the I had the phrase top five pick Woo! Thrown at me yesterday hello that's pretty that's pretty bold um, and that's not Rob Lewis said it but somebody close to the program wow. very close to the program that's good that out there all right, back to you, Austin. Better chance to see the field faster as a freshman, Callaway or Holiday? Who's going to return kickoffs and punts? Callaway. 
Bayless Jones. Ah, yeah, I like that. I like both of those there. Um, let's see here as we wrap it up. Uh, time getting away from us real quick. Is there one player from the past when Tennessee was recruiting him, you thought there was no way they'll ever contribute to the team, but somehow overcame the odds and went on to be a great solid player in hoops of football? Uh, when I saw Inky Johnson at 151 pounds, I did not think he would play football at Tennessee. I, I, saw, think- jo- I, saw, I saw John Fulgerson at basketball camp at, at Tennessee, I guess, what, five, six years ago? And was sitting next to Rob Lanier, who was telling me all these, you know, how, how, how good the kid could be. And I'm just sitting there going, man, I don't see it. <laughs> and as we're talking about, he just, he just, he's coming off here where he just dropped 27 on Kentucky and run arena when Tennessee beat him. Uh, Austin and that's could, why Rob Lanier is a head basketball coach. And I'm doing a podcast. With, 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 in your basement, yeah. right? With yeah. your house shoes on. Uh, could Jameer Johnson push enough to play at right tackle or just left tackle, Austin? I think it's left only for him. It's left only. Hey, Jameer Johnson, if if football doesn't work out, would be a phenomenal driver in NASCAR because he only goes left, Hubs. He only <laughs> goes left. Yeah, I think the right tackle spot, Cade. If you have to set out those court. road courses, though, where you have to turn right. <laughs> um, don't you think Cade, um, K-Ron Calvert, and then Darnell Wright, that's your three options at, at right tackle? Yes. Now, how that shakes out we don't, remains to be seen, but, but we'll see. That's the – you know, that's the – kind of the way that that looks at the right Rob, tackle. Rob, are you position. disappointed? He's quit reading their names. Like, I don't – who asked these questions the we last got, I, I know, AP. It's, it's a dog and pony show. <laughs> hey, I'm, a, I'm in charge here. Back to you, Austin. The last one, then we're going out the door. Out of the nine in-state kids – just because your last comment, you're going to get this one. I, this is from Go Vols 21. Out of the nine in-state kids ranked in the initial top to, or in the initial 2022 top 250, it seems like we don't hear a lot about Fisher, Anderson, Baron Brown, and Keaton Wade. Where are they on the Vols board? Where do the Vols stand with those guys? Uh, we just had something with uh, Fisher Anderson the other day. Eric Kane did a piece with him. Um, Barry on Brown, um, extremely raw wide receiver. Um, Tennessee's in the mix there, but, you know, he's taking things extremely slow. Um, you know, so I don't think he's doing anything anytime soon. And then Keaton Wade, uh, the balls like him. Uh, there's, of course, there's the Wade twins. So, um, you know, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, what you feel like the other brother can play. All right. Rob, back to you. Kennedy Chandler. I know you talked about it. You wrote about it. But how big of a deal is this for Tennessee? It's huge. I mean, he's, I mean it, it, it's the fourth five-star that, that Tennessee has signed. In, in the last three classes, but and, and they beat you know they beat out Josiah could have gone to do James Spring could have gone to North Carolina. Kennedy Chandler's final five is Tennessee, Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina, and the kids from Memphis and Memphis was was the fifth school. It's huge. I mean he's he's the highest rated player that Tennessee has signed this this century. The highest rated guy they've signed since Allen Houston. It's a big deal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> big deal. Big deal. Guy, guy can play and uh, will be fun to watch when he gets here, and hopefully we'll get to see how fun this basketball team will be. But before that, we hopefully will see more about this football team as they continue their practice. Jeremy Pruitt to meet the media later tonight. We'll have that for you on the site. Tennessee practicing today, Tennessee practicing tomorrow, and then taking Sunday off. Hey, want to remind you all about the summer heat that's here. We need to remind you about Blue Water Climate Control, the most practical thing you can do to avoid wasting money this time of year is to have your cooling system cleaned and tuned up. And the fact is, uh, if you don't, your energy bills are going to be higher and it's just like tuning up your car. Your system will be at greater risk for an expensive repair. That's why Blue Water's tune-up comes with two fantastic customer guarantees. First, if your system wasn't tuned up last year, they'll guarantee a $100 energy savings this summer or they'll refund your $79.99 for the tune-up. Second, if they tune your system up and it needs a repair this summer, you'll get a 20% repair discount. Speaking of repairs, Blue Water Climate Control is committed to doing the right repair the right way the first time. All of their repairs come with a one-year warranty. Call Blue Water Climate Control at 865-299-2290 or book an appointment online. Go to bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. Pick the day and the time that works for you. That's Blue Water Climate Control. That's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast. For Austin Price, Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Friday, everybody. (coughs) 